Okay, good evening, everybody. And welcome to TNT pre-show for season three, episode five. This is an opportunity to check your audio, check your video, pour yourself a glass of champagne or orange juice, and maybe have an after eight mint chocolate. <laughs> the pandemic appears to be uh, receding as we are all yearning for a new normal. Okay, so we'll go to full screen for our commercial. And I would encourage everyone to consider taking out a museum membership. Individual memberships are $75 and dual memberships are $100. So we're preparing for Valentine's Day here at the museum shop. We have a couple beautiful items. We have these Warren Stephen Scott earrings. They really look good with earbuds. And these things are flying off the shelf. They come in matched and odd pairings, which is appropriate to tonight. We're an odd pairing. And the other thing that we're promoting, if you don't want earrings for Valentine's, have a mug by Dave Doby. And so these are also beautifully crafted. And everything that we have in our gift shop comes from British Columbia. So go to shop.odaneartmuseum.com. So we're back to little screen and we've got one minute before we hit the top of the program. So the museum remains open as always from Thursday to Sunday, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And then we'll be open on the 21st of February, which is a Monday BC family day. And that, in fact, will be the final day of the Reappel exhibition called of Northern Landscapes and Indigenous Cultures, which has been one of the most popular special exhibition in the museum's five-year history. So I would encourage everybody to get up to Whistler, maybe bring your skis, and obviously it's a place that has clearly become a cultural mecca. So I see by the clock on the wall, I've got 11 minutes worth of chatter to go. What a beautiful ski day it was again today at minus one degrees and the conditions were absolutely perfect. And that's a good lead in to the top of the hour as I get rid of some paper here. Okay, everybody, we're ready to go. Welcome to Tuesday Night Talks, season three, episode five. Omicron is still upon us. So I would advise everyone to stay safe and be nice. Tonight, we're in the middle of the permanent collection galleries uh, here at the O'Dane Art Museum in Whistler, BC on the shared territories of the Squamish and Lillooet nations. So we're again by the flashlights glow. We have over 300 people registered for tonight's broadcast. And again, this is a milestone in terms of we're um, attracting three to 400 people every week. So we're very grateful. Great. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about the piece behind me called Orange Ceiling of 2001 that was generously donated to the museum by collector Greg Baker in Vancouver. And now we go live to her studio in Villemal in the southwest end of the island of Montreal. Hello, Vicky Alexander. How are you tonight? Hi, Curtis. I'm good. And uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this late night talk. I feel like Johnny Carson. But, uh, <laughs> probably not as funny, but I'll see what we can do. <laughs> I'll work on my golf swing. Yeah. <laughs> So that's actually great because uh, Vicky is staying up late for us tonight. It's uh, 11 o'clock in Montreal. So we're very appreciative uh, because we won't be off the air until midnight Eastern time. Oh my so God. let's, <laughs> you can, you'll make it, won't you, Vicky? I think I can make it, yeah. <laughs> All right, that's great to hear. Okay, so... Um, Perhaps we can jump right into your work and, and a quite an early uh, piece called Pieta of 1981, and it's a C print. And maybe you can discuss your, your entry as a professional artist and 
uh, this photo-based work with a, a very interesting void at the top of the image. Um, yeah, this is work that I did, like you said, 1981. So I moved into New York in 1979 and um, coming from Halifax, Nova Scotia, where I went to Nazca. And I started doing work with um, found imagery from fashion magazines. This was an image, um, I think it was from Vogue magazine. Uh, I think also it's a Richard Avedon shot. And I was sort of interested in the concept of uh, flipping the gender on the Pieta. And I, all, this image is enlarged quite a bit. So you can tell that it's uh, an image from another image. The size is basically six foot tall and maybe two feet across. Um, the black is it's some severely cropped and all the text from the ad is out, but the black on the top, um, because there's a plexi or glass over the black mat, the black thing kind of turns into a black mirror or, and so that the, um, the person who's looking at the image sees themselves like the normal person reflected on top of these "Quote unquote supermodels." Oh, okay. That's that's an interesting and and you know what's the purpose of having the viewer reflected in the piece? I think I I don't I want um, well pretty much a lot of my images use mirrors, and um, I think I'm I'm interested in people being aware that they're actively looking at something, like it's not a passive thing. It's a it's an activity. And so and I want them to be somewhat self-conscious about their act of looking and what they're looking at. And then the choice of calling this a pieta, obviously the religious reference, any other undertones to that? Not title? really, I just thought, I was sort of trying to put fashion, which as you know, is uh, fairly fleeting into something that was more art historical. And pietas have been done you know, like this century does a pieta, this decade does a pieta, it, it goes on. So I was thinking that this would be the 1980s pieta. Great, okay. And then we'll move to an, a piece from 1997 called Autumn Spring. And here we see it installed at the Pittsburgh Center for Arts. So take us through again, the installation process and and how you want the viewer to position themselves uh, with regards to the a very interesting juxtaposition of uh, landscape uh, imagery. Well, um, some of the people who are watching tonight might have seen a piece that I did um, that is in the collection of the Vancouver Art Gallery called Lake in the Woods. And that's a piece I did in 1986, I think in New York. And on one side, kind of a corridor, there is a, a store-bought scenic mural. And on the other side are wood laminate shells and mirrors. And so I that piece is very specific. It kind of has to be in a fairly narrow kind of corridor-like space. And so for Pittsburgh, I thought, well, let me see if I can't do it more as a corner piece or some version of it. So I picked two murals of um, sort of opposing colors, like the blue and the orange. And then I added these two, I think they're Archaea mirrors and you can see them kind of in the corner. So there's a circular mirror and then a rectangular mirror. And so first of all, they reflect each other. So it's a little bit like Alice in the Looking Glass, like you think you can actually go through the mural itself. But also, again, if the viewer positions themselves, they can see it's, it's a moment of self-awareness for them as well. And when you're selecting this, this type of scenery, um, are you just looking for the most ordinary kind of scenes or generic kinds of scenes? Well, for this, I guess I was specifically looking for two, you know, the colors that were complementary. Um, with Lake in the Woods, I think it was, weirdly enough, a piece that reminded me of um, my cottage in Quebec. So it kind of had a, I wouldn't say sentimentality, but it was something that was known to me. It seemed like it could have been a, a place that I knew. These two are more, you know, a lot more exotic, so not so much. <laughs> and, and the tropical scene on the right, 
Is that just another sort of generic image that you were able to pull? Yeah, they're both the same. Like I said, there's a catalog there. There was a catalog probably, I'm sure they're kind of almost over now, but in the seventies and eighties of these kind of murals that you could buy and um, jazz up your rec room or, you know, a lobby, okay. a bad so lobby. The, <laughs> so in that way, they, they, I, I'm assuming they function like wallpaper. Yeah, they're totally wallpaper. Sorry, yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, and, they come in panels and you can put them up. And again, with the, the IKEA mirrors that you mentioned, you know, do you want the viewer to be reflected in that or the pieces reflect off against each other? And Well, I guess this one, because it's in a corner, it's more the, the one image looking into the other somehow, like two peepholes. With the lake in the woods, it was more of the viewer being reflected in the landscape, like they were part of that landscape. Okay. And now we'll move actually to orange ceiling, uh, which is here behind me, as I mentioned, in the middle uh, space of the permanent uh, galleries. And perhaps you can walk us through the elements from foreground to middle ground to background with orange ceiling and, and kind of give us a sense of why and how you position the various elements, uh, whether they're furniture or architecture or landscape here. Well, this, this, um, these pieces I started in, I think around 2000, I did a residency in Holland and I was trying to um, design rooms where previous to that I had made um, glass furniture, which wasn't furniture, it was sculpture, but it looked like very minimal glass sculpture. I think I had some in the, I know I had some in the exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery. And so I started with these rooms and then I thought, oh, I'm not really interested in this. And then I started thinking about the rooms themselves and what would go in them. And I was using, again, I've always used found imagery. And I'm also using things like MACTAC, like shelving paper and some very old fashioned architectural, um, what's it called? Sort of like letter set kind of stuff that you just rub on. Like that's what the floor is made out of. But I yes. like these kind of utopian minimalist buildings that seem to be built a little too close to the landscape. Like the landscape is a little more, might be a little closer than the client would have wanted. And that's um, in this one, not so much. This is fairly benign, but in, there's one behind me. I don't know if you guys can see it and it's a little bit later, it's 2007. But the landscape itself just, it's, it's actually a photograph I took from um, in Ottawa in the late, was it late, late 90s when there was a huge ice storm. And so this is like all this kind of very frozen, the frozen river and the, the, the way that icicles kind of get on the branches, like they're, it's like you stuck your hand in frozen water and they come out. So the landscape is a lot more threatening, even though you have this fairly warm, light here that's going well it might be okay at home but out there i don't know it looks pretty bad <laughs> so it's a little bit like a like i said flawed utopia is what i use for a lot of my work so oh and it, it seems that your you know your references to furniture are, are really right within that kind of modernist design is is that a particular style and era that you're attracted to in your work well, I'm attracted to it, and it's also really easier to cut out. <laughs> Good. That's being practical. Um, but how you position that off against, you know, these, it, it, it feels like almost a geometric abstraction with the bars uh, across the top and the middle. I mean, uh, is there references to painting in your work that you're consciously making? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't do. <laughs> Okay, um, and then the you had mentioned MacTac again. Do you want your images to have somewhat of a textural quality by that kind of use of that material? I think I just like the reference of um, this kind of. A lot of my work is about the artificial landscape, and so I do. I I like these materials that are pretending to be something else. So. And I try to 
get the best ones I can. Like there's a lot of Mac tack that looks uh, quote unquote tacky. And I try to buy the superior models that actually look a lot more like wood. I don't mean superior in a hierarchical way, but photographically they're superior. <laughs> there are less flaws. So is, is there a kind of a, a, a sense in your work that of the emphasizing the superficial, whether it's references to fashion or in this case materials, is that something that interests you regularly? Well, I guess I, well, I've had this article, this art, not argument, but this discussion before, and we can't go too deep on it because it can get quite philosophical and I, I'm not that philosophical, but I find those things themselves are, they're not superficial, they're actually real. They're just real MACTAC. So, like I said, I know there, there, some philosophy person could go mental with this, but I, I can't. <laughs> okay, and nor will I. How's that? That sounds good. <laughs> okay. Um, and anything that you'd like to say about orange, orange ceiling in terms of closing out this part of the discussion on this piece in the collection? I don't think so. I mean, I know that it's, it's in your collection and I should have a lot more to say about it. It's, um, but I don't. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So now we'll move a little ahead in time to a work from 2017. And this is called Spot Waterfall. And again, can you talk about, you know, references to, again, that wood paneling that you seem drawn to off against, you know, the, the, the geometric arrangements of those colored spots and that waterfall image in the middle? Well, I guess the wood paneling is just turned into my Eve Klein blue. I just really like it. So I use it when I can. And in this case, as you can see, I've sort of eliminated um, a lot of the domestic, most of the domestic elements from the room, if this can even be a room anymore. Like I still see it that way because that's the way it started, but it becomes a lot more abstract and the elements are reduced. I'm really so curious. Cares. I think it's more like um, you become the person in the room. It's not like somebody else's room. Now it's your room because there's no furniture. Or it's not designed in any particular way. And I'm and really again, cur curious sorry? about the, the red shape and how you arrived at that shape. No. Oh. The, the framing device that you use that, that's angular that you No, no, I know. Waterfall. Sorry, Curtis, I know what you're talking about, but I can't really say why it's it's there. Okay. And um, so is what you're trying to do is, as you said, position the viewer in the room in this very kind of abstract way? Yes, I think so. And then I think, like, to me, clearly the spots read as a floor. Um, I'm not sure the red might, might be just breaking it up because it was so, you know, kind of rigid. So that might be just a little bit of a folly in there. But I guess sort of like the, the, the waterfall that's like, is that coming in my house? Like, how could I possibly have, have that window right next to the waterfall? I, I'm kind of curious because as you know, in, in West Coast architecture, you know, there's always an effort to bring nature into domestic settings and yes. is that played an influence on on how you create these works um i'm not sure that the west coast so much i think i'm into um let's see i've done a lot of i've done work with uh theme parks like the west edmonton mall and they're bringing the outside inside right like the fake beach and the tropical trees they have in there and atriums and uh let's see what else have i done work with uh the q gardens okay so yeah the, uh, the palm house at q gardens i've photographed that and that's another way of you know the architecture trying to encapsulate the natural okay i'm starting to get a sense of you know how you like those artificial environments that mimic both natural and constructed environments. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, and the last uh, work that we'll talk about 
before we go into the Q&A is called Swamp Stripes, also of 2017. And again, you're creating a kind of a pseudo room and I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, this is very similar to the other one. I mean, to the previous one. And I'm sure you're gonna say, what's up with the red ceiling, Vicki? <laughs> So again, it's like who would build their their house, their dream home, just on the verge of the swamp. So of course, it's not just. I mean, you can see that I've tried to uh, the wiggle of the what are they? The moss seems to go with slightly with the the wiggle of the wood, and then you get the stripes trying to straighten things out, and then the red the red chevron is kind of a dramatic thing on the top. So. Like I said, I think it's it's quite it's similar. And what is it with your fascination? You, you know, as as we speak, I'm finding that you know you, you're you're fascinated by architecture, and has that always played a central role in your work? Yeah, I took, when I was at um, NASC, when I was at Nova Scotia College of Art, I took some courses in architecture at um, I think it's called Tuns University, Technical University of Nova Scotia, just because. Um, I started to get interested in it through Dan Graham, who was one of my professors in Nova Scotia. And then I studied with Larry Richards, um, who was the, he was teaching at Tons. Um, yeah, I've just always been interested in architecture, so. And in, in terms of your, your use of color, um, now that you mentioned NASCAD in Halifax, um, did Gary Neal Kennedy have an impact on your work? No, he was so shy. <laughs> okay. He could barely talk. I mean, he was a, a lovely man, I think, but very, he just, um, not so convivial, at least. He always looked like he, he was rushing somewhere else. And, but I know that doesn't even have anything to do with his work. But at that point, I think not, he hadn't, this, we're talking like late seventies, right? So he was really heavily involved in running the school and he was making work, but not the kind of work that you're probably thinking of now, right? Well, I, I know his, you know, those big areas of broad, you know, flat colored stripes and words mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Um, so I was just curious if, you know, some of that use of, of that kind of color positioning and architectural or mm -hmm. architectonic elements are an outgrowth of your time at NASCAP. Well, I, I honestly had never thought of that, but it doesn't mean, I mean, these, those stripes there are, these are origami paper oh, that, okay. I bought, that I bought at a mall in Richmond. So I have, you know, stacks of, you know, these kind of things to choose from. So I can't say that I, it's a direct influence from Gary. Okay. God well, Ross, he, he might have influenced me in other ways, but possibly not in the stripes. <laughs> okay. And uh, actually, you mentioned something. As you kind of go about your daily life, do you collect papers and MACTAC and things knowing that you may have a use for them later? Oh, yeah. And do you hoard them in your studio? <laughs> hoard is a nasty word. Okay. <laughs> I believe they're cataloged. <laughs> okay. They're cataloged in your studio. And actually, that's an interesting, we had talked about that earlier today. Um, do you catalog materials and images uh, to, for later reference? I do. And has that been something that you've done over the duration of your career? Um, probably, yeah. It's easy to do with, with when you're talking about photographs. I mean, whether it's, you know, in the olden days, it'd be like collecting, you know, just keeping track of your slides and the and negatives and things like that. Now it's digital files, but also analog in terms of paper, paper samples. Okay. All right. So um, now we're going to move into the question and answer uh, part of the uh, broadcast, which is always quite fun because we do get uh, some fascinating questions from uh, throughout BC and across Canada and occasionally internationally. And so the first question comes from Fanny in West Vancouver. 
And she asks, okay. how has living in Montreal, New York, and Vancouver affected your practice in different ways? Well, that's a good question, broad. Um, I mean, New York was a great place to live in my 20s and early 30s, and I'm glad I did it. And um, I certainly made a lot of um, contacts there. Um, it wasn't the easiest place to get photographic work done. Like the labs were very expensive and there weren't that many of them and they were uptown. When I moved to Vancouver, in um, 92, it was, uh, there were great labs there. It was much easier to get large scale prints done. And there's also, um, you know, artists who had similar, similar interests in me and could help me um, figure out where to get things done. I mean, that's also helpful, right? You need to know the sources and framers and things like that. And Montreal, the same thing. I mean, I've met great artists in all three places. Um, Montreal is good right now, except it's February 8th and it's really cold out here. <laughs> but apart from that, it's a lovely city. <laughs> and, and I have friends and, you know, it's nice being closer to New York and Europe. I like that too. Is, and in Montreal, do you find, how do you find your work uh, relates to the, the Montreal scene in terms of photo-based work and painting and and the things that are happening in Montreal right now. Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm not sure so much, although they do see, well, like I said, I've, I was recently shortlisted for a public art project. So it didn't, it made me think, oh, well, that's kind of cool. And I've been bought by public collections here, which is really nice recently. So it's been welcoming that way. I've had exhibitions and stuff. So I find it to be um, quite good. There's always different, what can I say, different, different pockets of different types of artists in all cities, right? So, and Montreal, I think is a bit, it's larger than Vancouver. So, you know, there's going to be a painting group and a this group and a that group, but um, possibly less photographic practice, but nah, not, so, I don't know. I think it's okay. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because there was definitely a push in Montreal on the photo scene that, that paralleled Vancouver, but in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we'll now move to our next question and it comes from Omar in Hope. Have changes to computer and photographic technology impacted your creative process? <laughs> <laughs> Omar, yes, I had to get a very good assistant. <laughs> I know that from our process this week. <laughs> I know. No, I have, um, let's see. I mean, I guess when you're, when you're a photographer and you're making larger scale prints, I mean, you always have to interact with other people. You have to interact with your lab. And, you know, so I feel like it's a bit of a, it's a shared process in the beginning, but now I seem to share it at a possibly earlier stage. Although, as you can see, my... I make the collages myself, <laughs> the end, you know, and then they go on. So it's still a pretty analog practice, but, and I take the photographs myself, but after that, there's more intervention. And so you've never really transitioned away from the analog, analog to purely digital, is that correct? Well, I use a digital camera now, but um, if that's what you're thinking of, like I don't shoot on film anymore. Okay. But uh, and, somebody else takes care of the everything else, kind of. That's, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Um, and now we have a question that comes from Skylar in Lethbridge. Um, what are some of the magazines you have used on a regular basis for source material in your art? Uh -huh. That's funny. Well, in the early days, in the 80s, um, and this is just kind of a sidebar, but I used to waitress at a little restaurant in Soho. And then on the way home, there was a little uh, a bookshop called, what was it called? Soho Books or something. 
anyway, I'd go in there and, you know, look through the magazines and, you know, they'd be 20 bucks or something and I couldn't afford them. And then I made friends with the manager and I told him what I was going to use them for. And he said, okay, Vicki, if you take them home for a couple of nights, just bring them back to me. And if they're in one piece, it's all cool. So I used to be able to get like the higher end, um, like the European magazines, which just had a better print quality. So I used to use those for the early material. And the recent, the recent works that you're gonna see um, after the question and answer period, because they were larger scale collages, like say 16 by 20, I have been using what W magazine because that's a larger format um, fashion magazine, but it depends on what I'm collaging. Like I've also used uh, architectural magazines and um, pretty much I'll take, I just look through everything. I mean, they're used to me and usually I end up buying something. So it's not like I'm a complete creep. So um, that's, that's what happens. And do you still have like, records and pages from all those different magazines over the years as, as part of your reference collection? Yeah, some of them, but only the ones that I bought, not the ones I gave back to him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And you're able to cart those around from studio to studio fairly effectively? They're not that many. I mean, I didn't, in the 80s, I didn't make that many works because uh, like I said, I was waitressing and making big prints was expensive and framing them. So maybe I made three pieces, you know, a year, maybe. Oh, so I um, it's not like I'm carting around that much. <laughs> <laughs> maybe a binder, you know, like that's it. <laughs> okay, that's it. Actually, I did notice uh, earlier today, you had a series of binders. Oh, all you. those binders. Yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So next, we're going to move to a question uh, from Joanne, uh, who writes in from Victoria. Uh, can you explain your creative process as an artist um, from concept to realization? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I start with, what do I start with? Sometimes, sometimes ideas come from novels. Sometimes they come from films. Sometimes they come from travel. Sometimes they come from materials, I guess, you know, like MacTac. Who knew? Um, and I'm not sure what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Yeah, I think um, for the MacTac, for example, I had made the um, Lake in the Woods piece. Um, which was an installation. And then I thought, well, this is an installation. I wonder if I can make something like this, but not like just as a, just as a work, like not an installation, but just as a, you know, contained piece. So then I found the MacTac and made some pieces with that. And then the MacTac just seems to keep coming back. I know there's probably a, long, a joke in there, but I'm not sure what it is, or at least a rhyme, but the Mac tech comes back. So I'm not sure if that answers exactly your question. I mean, as you get older, which I luckily did, um, you've, I'm interested in very particular things. So like I said, I'm into the 19th century and um, architecture of that period. Uh, what is it, steel and glass architecture, um, utopian stuff from the 20s, um, modernist Richard Neutra. And then I'm into, like I said, West Edmonton Mall and uh, Disneyland. So it kind of crosses all the things, but so somehow there's some kind of connection. And do you ever sort of kind of do small sketches of, of the different types of images or do you just jump right into making the image? I just jump right in. All right. <laughs> and do, do your images, that being the singular images, ever slowly morph or, or provide you for inspiration for your more installation-based work? Um, I think they probably do, but it could go the other way too as, as you, well, as we're going to talk about with the, the next body of work when we're done with this, 
Um, there was an installation that I did previous to that that then kind of worked its way back into uh, the new collages. Okay. Not trying to, you know, spoiler alert, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure people will still be fascinated. Uh -huh. So the, la the last question uh, comes from Bernie in uh, Laval, which is just north of the island of Montreal. And he asks, what has been your relationship to those artists that are associated with the Vancouver School of Photo Conceptualism and or the New York uh, Pictures Generation? So let's start with uh, Vancouver. He's not looking for some tattler kind of stuff, is he? Like, <laughs> who did I go out with or something? That's no, no, I don't think it's uh, okay. Just want any any dirt on anybody in Vancouver, but more so. No, no, no. <laughs> there is no dirt. Trust me, there is no dirt. Um, but the Vancouver scene. I mean, what what do you think your relationship was to that whole photo conceptualism? Um, well, I. Friend? Um, when I was in New York, um, I'd known through Dan Graham, I met, uh, I think I met Ian, Rodney and Jeff. So they used to, when I, when I was living in New York, they would come over, or, you know, when they were in town and have a drink or something like that. And, you know, we had a, you know, casual friendship kind of thing. Right. So that was fine. And then I thought I, I did. Oh, can you hear this? Oh, no, we're good. Okay, because the, the snow, 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 it's fine. snow machines are going crazy out there. No, it's fine. Okay, good. Um, and then I did a few shows at the Cobra Gallery in Vancouver in the early 80s. And so we'd go out for dinner and things like that. So I think it seemed like a reason. That's why partially why it seemed like a reasonable place to move when I moved to Vancouver in 92. But of course, since then, it's not that um, I think I'm friendly with all those guys. It's just that they're doing things everywhere else. They have their own lives and they have huge careers. So um, Ian was in a group studio with me at 188 West, West Third. So I'd see him more often than anybody else. But, you know, Ronnie's got a family. He's got shows all over the place. Jeff has got, you know, God knows what. So I think it's all good. So it's not, you just kind of lose touch with people. And the same with New York. I haven't lived there in so many years, but I still have friends there. And um, I think I had a good group of uh, peer artists when I was, you know, growing up and starting to show there. So it was good. Well, in fact, you're in their company, so to speak, here in the museum. Just adjacent to your piece is a, is a diptych by Ian, and just around the corner is a piece by Jeff Wall, and, and around the other corner is a Rodney Graham. So it can offer our visitors uh, a very interesting. Um, Kind of capsulated look at you know some of those aspects of the Vancouver scene. Now the the um, the pictures generation, as I understand it, is is kind of an outgrowth of the pop movement. Any any relationships there or influence on your work? Um, yeah, I would say so. You know, like I said, when I moved there, it was like you know Sherry Levine, Barbara Kruger, Richard Prince were all working, and so. Um, I was doing very similar stuff, Sarah Charlesworth. So there was a lot of photographers and a lot of female photographers, which was great. So um, I was a little bit shocked when I moved to, uh, what have I heard it called, Vancouver? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, well, what happened to the, where are the ladies here? What's going on? So, oh, that's a great one. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> Thank well, you for that. hang on to that, yeah. <laughs> I shall. <laughs> okay, so now we're gonna move right into your contemporary work. And and we have actually a series of really beautiful images, all from 2021. And uh, the, the start of each title is Les Jardins de Notre à Versailles. And this is Vue de Bassin d'Enclade. And let's roll right into the discussion on this piece, Vicky. Okay, so these are pieces that I did, I've done 1920 to 21. Is that right? So I just finished the series really, um, oh, maybe in August of 21. And some of them were shown at the art fair in Toronto um, in October. I think I had five or six of them. 
And then the whole series is um, going to be up next week at the, I think it's called Manif in Quebec City. It's like a, a very large international kind of group show. So they're showing, they're 13 altogether in the series. And they're about 40 by 60 inches each. But each collage, I know this one's a square, but they're about, I don't know, 14 by 20 or something. So that's why when someone's asking me about my sources, I kind of had to find magazines with bigger pieces of paper that would fill this a little better. But you can see I've had to kind of puzzle it together somehow. And so I think um, Curtis and I were talking and I was trying to explain that they come I don't want to give the whole thing away. Are we let, can I show something here, Curtis? Sure, sure you can. Okay, so that one is like, can you see oh, this? I see. Yes, I can. Okay, sorry. So that's like an etching from um, this book that I bought at the Canadian Center for Architecture here. And they're, they're all etchings that were done where, is there a date on this? Classic, no, not right in front of me, but yeah, 17, 1747, you know, mid 17. And so I decided to crop it and blow it up and then puzzle it back together. And so I focused on the, the water elements, which are these fountains at Versailles, which I've actually never seen bubbling. I've seen them with no water, but not with water. And so the people are eliminated, any complicated elements are eliminated. And so we just have sort of the foreground, the fountain is the most important thing and some foliage in the sky. And occasionally like in this one, there's a little gray area and that's a leftover piece of the etching. Okay, and let's move to the next piece, which is called Vue de Bassin de Neptune. And this Again. is a, a very odd, shape in the foreground here in blue. I don't even know. Yeah, that is probably just some, I think it was somebody gave me a shopping bag and I cut it up and there's still a wrinkle in it. Again, I like to keep things like that in there because I know I could get my assistant to, you know, get rid of it, but I, I wanted to have some hands-on element to it. And these are some, so some, most of this is magazine, but like I said, that was like a little a shopping bag and then on top part of the sky is um, a strip from my wall my wall vinyls or something so it's a it's a test strip that I just cut up which is why it's more it's more pixelated it's like a different resolution very good and the next piece is called uh, vue de trois fontaines and yeah, and again and this one, same thing, except you can see I've used another kind of Mac tack. It's like brick Mac tack on the bottom of the fountain. And the fountain kind of looks like a bird. It looks like, I mean, I like that it's sort of chopped up somehow. These pieces appear to me in, in comparison to the earlier works I've seen, they all sort of crash into the viewer at once and they're, they're much more intense and concentrated. Is, is that where your work is going right now, would you say? Good question. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, like I'm still um, processing these pieces because it's not that long that I finished them. And um, I guess I started them when my, uh, my husband was diagnosed with ALS a couple of years ago and um, he passed away. Well, he passed away a couple of years ago, but when he was diagnosed and I started looking after him, I, this was a project that I was working on very intensely because I, I had to keep myself going. And so, uh, I don't know, I can't, it's hard to remove myself from, I can't, I, I can't just see them yet, exactly. There, but yeah, and sorry to hear of your. No, loss. sorry, that was a weird story, but sorry about that. No, no, I mean these are the things that affect you as an artist, so that's that's really good insight. Uh, next, we'll go to Vue de Arc de Triomphe, and you have these little ghostly figures floating around. I know. Foreground and middle ground. 
Well, the thing is, I was thinking, like I said to, I was telling Curtis that I, I had all these, I cut up the magazines. I go, okay, this will work for water. I've got blue, I've got green, I've got yellow, I've got, you know, uh, flowers, I've got whatever. And so I was running out of um, blue because like they're water elements, right? So I was like, going, okay, what else can I make these fountains out of? And I saw this drapery in some magazine. And I thought, well, maybe I can just use that. Like really, it's just about flowing. So let's try that. And then I said, they look a little bit like shrouded figures. Didn't you say that? They're ghosts. Yes, actually. I'm not sure what they are, but they're still okay. <laughs> It doesn't and have it, to be literal, yeah. It, it sounds like your process is very immediate and you're just reacting to how um, images and textures kind of relate to each other in the moment. Would that mm -hmm. be inaccurate? Uh, I think it's true. And like I said, you have to respond to the things that um, come at you through the magazine. You know what I mean? Like I can pick a magazine going, okay, yeah, this is good because it's got a lot of beach stuff in it and I kind of need that now. But then you're going to find something else and go, hey, wait a sec. And maybe that could be a cool element, you know? So huh. you just never know. You have to kind of, um, you have to be tight and loose at the same time. That sounds crazy, but. I, I think I understand what you mean. And again, I, I just, I find there's an intensity to this new work that, that really marks it as quite different from the previous pieces that we've seen. Well, it could be, could be so. Oh, somebody just uh, sent in a question on the, on the chat part of the function here on Zoom. And Are they allowed? I think it's, uh, they're allowed. We're just going to go with the flow. <laughs> what happens to the physical collage after you shoot it? Well, I kind of save it, but I don't sell it if that's what they're. Oh, no, I don't think that's what they were inferring. They were just curious about that residual element from, from your creation. I kind of keep it, but um, they're, not, they're not that stable, even though the glue I use is good and that stuff. But I find that they're, you got to scan them fairly quickly because of the different types of paper that go on top of each other. Like some of these are vinyl and then the the paper paper doesn't sit so well for so long on the vinyl, so. Okay, and, um, and so thank you to Marshall who, who sent that in on the, on the chat function because that, that was actually an interesting, uh, you know, commentary on, on the piece versus the collage uh, that uh, originates. Hi, so Marshall. Lot... <laughs> Do you know Marshall? Yeah. Hi, Anne. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and we have got two more images to look at. And the next one is called Vue de Bain de Paulin. And uh, again, I, th this is, uh, I really like those, I'm going to call them tree like things. I mean, they are trees, but the way you've clipped and cut them, uh, they take on a different quality. Can you no, the about? trees are crazy. I think I think this is the one RBC bought, I think. But the trees really were not, that was some kind of editorial on um, something in Los Angeles and they're all these street shots. But I thought these trees are incredible. And I thought, how can I, it wouldn't have, it's just, you know, the longer you go, like the first of these collages that I did where I think were a lot tighter. I was just trying to be a good a good collagist, good school girl. It's like, okay, grass is green, you know, trees are like trees. And then as you keep going, you go, oh, what a hack with it. So <laughs> these are trees that would not be growing in France, but guess what? They're fine. And I take it the little pool in, in the foreground is, is the reference to the, to the bath of Apollo? Yep, that's all you get. And maybe the green blobs, I think, are supposed to be, I'm not sure if they're supposed to be water or a little, I mean, at a certain point, you just start, I don't cross-reference. I just go, well, that's it now. So it's over. Okay. And the final piece that we're going to look at, again, from this uh, Jardin de Notre Dame. Oh, I love that. Yeah. This, this is actually a quite arresting piece. And it's called Le Vue de Théâtre de Eau, so Theater of Water. 
It does look quite, kind of like theater, right? Because you can see that there's, you know, the parting of the waves there, although they're just made out of foam or snow or something. And, and you've returned to the, the wood paneling effect in this piece as well. I can't help it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, and the sky in the background, what, what, what's the reference there? Where, where the sky, I that I just left, it's not blank, but that's um, just part of the, uh, the original etching that I just left. I thought, well, I don't have to fill in everything either, so. And, and the last thing in the, that I, I can't help but notice in, in all these uh, recent works, you seem to acknowledge that, that digitization process, the breakup of the image, and particularly here with the, I guess, the natural elements in both corners as a framing device in the sky. Mm -hmm. and Again, those are parts, those are, um, what should I say, uh, little parts of my, of the big murals that I do, those are like test strips and I just cut out little parts of that. So they're, they're enlarged to be like 30 foot high. So that's why they're really grainy, pixelated. Okay. But and I like any, the contrast of that with like the, the etching, the 18th century etching, and then this kind of actual MACTAC and then the, uh, the magazine pixels, so. Yeah, there's a, a wonderful uh, combination of, of different kinds of surfaces. So any, any closing comments on this uh, Versailles series that you'd like to make before we, we head into the thank yous? I don't think so. I think I'm, a, I'm, I'm good if you're good. I'm great. Okay, well, thank you, Vicki. <laughs> and I wanna thank Michael O'Dane and Yoshi Karasawa for their ongoing support. Thank you to our trustees and founders, our patron for TNT series, uh, season three, Susan Roop, uh, the staff and volunteers at the museum who are always hardworking, our TNT crew, our director producer, Justine Nickel, our quality control coordinator, uh, Paige Keith, our members, you the viewer, uh, our shout out tonight, as always, is to my parents, Anne and Roy Collins, uh, TNT season three is a tribute to them. Uh, my little sister Susie in Canada, who's also staying up late, like you, Vicki, it's That's almost crazy. midnight there. And do you have any shout outs, Vicki, anyone you want to say hi to other than Marshall and Anne? Well, Marshall and Anne already said hi to if, if Diane and Andy are out there. Hi, if Marion is out there or Linda or Lisa and Al. Hi, nice to see you guys. <laughs> or Everybody's floating out in the ether somewhere. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and thanks, thanks, Curtis. And thanks to, again, Michael and Yoshi, too, for, you know, having you in that museum. So it's great. Okay. So next week's TNT will feature uh, Stephen Waddell from Vancouver. And this was wonderful, Vicki. I want to say good night from the O'Dane Art Museum in Whistler, BC, on the shared territories of the Squamish and Little Lot Nations. Good night, Vicki. Bonsoir. <laughs> okay. Ciao. Thanks. Take care.